This show is brought to you by listeners and viewers like you. EvanX.com Tesla Accessories, our Tesla Owners Online.com community, and our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Tesla Owners Online. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another show, and I'm joined by my friends Eric and Ian. How are you guys doing? Bonsoir, Good. Long. Bonsoir. Excellent. We <laughs> thought we'd do a show tonight because uh, Tesla has announced their 2020 Q4 2020 earnings. So we have uh, lots to talk about on the financial side, but of course they dropped a big bomb on us. It was kind of anticipated for some time, obviously, the fully refreshed Model S and Model X, mostly on the interior, but we'll get to that because that's super exciting. But I want to let Eric take point tonight and uh, tell us a little bit about some of the financials. We'll discuss that. And then what, after we're done with the SNX discussion, we're going to listen live to the webcast of the earnings call, and then we'll be able to comment a little bit on what's going on. All right, Eric, take it away. All right, so we'll highlight a few of the numbers that came out with their FY 2020 update for Q4. Uh, first thing is a lot of people want to focus on cash. How much money does Tesla make uh, so far for Q4 last year? And the good news is they're operating cash flow less their um, capital expenditures or CapEx um, was 2.8 billion with a B in all of 2020. Uh, they have a $4.9 billion increase in their cash and cash equivalents in quarter four, which gives them a total yield of $19.4 billion, uh, giving them a free cash flow of $1.9 billion in Q4. So very good numbers there in that report. Included in these numbers, they did indicate that for the full calendar year of 2020, they achieved an industry-leading 6.3% operating margin, despite an increase of SBC of $1.7 billion. So I'm not a financial expert by any means, but obviously when you're industry leading, uh, as far as what's been reported so far, that's certainly very significant, especially in a COVID stricken year. Profitability is their next section they go into. They had a $721 million gap net income out of $2.5 billion non-gap net income in all of 2020. Focusing on just Q4 alone, they had $270 million of a gap net income, $903 million of non-GAAP net income, minus the SBC figures, which we indicated were an increase um, in the year, uh, all of that, again, being in Q4. Their operating income was $575 million GAAP income in um, that quarter, and then a 5.4% operating margin in the quarter as well. Now, the uh, numbers we did see right as we turned the calendar into January, they did indicate their um, production and delivery figures, which are reiterated again in this report. Um, about half a million vehicles were produced and delivered in all of 2020. As far as deliveries, just under the half a million mark, but we were really, really close in doing that. But they did build over half a million cars last year. Model Y production at the Gigafactory Shanghai started in December of 2020. So we saw reports of that in our show recently. And good news, big news, we'll get into this now with Trevor, is that we're updating the Model S and Model X uh, that's launching effective this month, now in January 2021. So Trevor, those are the figures. Where are we going to go from here? Well, I want to point out one thing that's of interest to me, and that's a little bit later down in the shareholder letter. Well, shareholder, I mean the financial letter. Under operating mm -hmm. expenses, research and development. Um, I'm always curious to see what Tesla is spending on R&D. So just for comparison, in Q4 of 2019, they spent $345 million. In Q1 of uh, 2020, it was 324. Q2, 279. Q3 of 2020, 366. Q4 2020, $522 million. So things are starting to uh, to go up. Now, what does that mean at the end of the day? Well, that's new projects. What are they working on mm -hmm. internally? Um, part of the other uh, thing in the letter is uh, they expect to start first deliveries of the semi this year as well. So obviously there's some movement happening on some new projects. Uh, again, no mention in here really as to what's going on with Roadster, just a tiny little bit about Cybertruck, but that's mostly related to the factories are coming online. They also say that they are definitely uh, on track to start um, uh, production in Berlin and Austin sometime this year, uh, leveraging their battery cells and stuff. So anyways, I think it's good news all the way around. 
Um, we are going to leave the deep dive into financials to people that are better suited for that. There are some YouTube <laughs> channels that are very good at that thing. Rob Maurer's Tesla uh, podcast and Galileo Russell of HyperChange. They do an excellent job of that kind of thing. So we'll leave that to the experts. I highly recommend you go listen to those guys if you're really into the numbers game. Uh, we like to just kind of take a 30,000 foot view of, you know, financials mm -hmm. and see what, you know, what things are doing. Uh, so far, it looks really good. Now, uh, the big news, obviously, today that really dropped, and we expected this, um, was the long-rumored, expected, speculated, anticipated, overdue, whatever you want to call it. Beaten uh, to death. Beaten to death. <laughs> um, I mean, we're, we're talking like dating back 18, 20 months worth of rumors now. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely true. Uh, this, uh, the, the rumored refresh of the Model S and the X uh, has, have been going on for the last couple of years. Now, to be completely honest, if you look back on it, because hindsight's always twenty twenty. Model 3, as we know, uh, was very painful for Tesla to ramp up production. So that consumed all of the resources. I'm sure that had things gone the way that they expected and Model 3 was going to be a lot smoother, that the refresh would have happened a lot sooner. But obviously that didn't happen. So today's the day they finally announced um, after, well, late last year, they said they were going to shut down the factory for a period of a couple of weeks to retool the factory. And we've said this be you know, before, you, you don't shut down a production line um, when you have demand that outstrips supply. There's a reason you do this. You do it for legitimate reasons. Either you're actually really doing maintenance or you're refreshing, you're retooling, and that's exactly what's happened here. Now, I did grab some images that I will show, um, but we'll also go to the Tesla website and show you some of the configurator. Um, so I'm just going to bring this up here on the screen. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see this is the new Model S. Now, honestly, it doesn't look that much different from the current Model S. It has a new fascia on the front, which is kind of reminiscent of what we saw of the Model, uh, Model S that was testing uh, for the last, well, year and a half at the Nürburgring track. I said that right this time. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably some little better, uh, bigger fender flares in the back and new diffusers. So on the exterior, it doesn't really look all that different. Um, obviously, Chrome is Black gone. Trim. You know, Chrome is gone. We've been predicting this for like the longest time now. Chrome is definitely dead as far as Tesla is concerned. So the last two cars to not have uh, uh, to get the Chrome delete treatment. Uh, you can't call it a Chrome delete. If there's no Chrome to begin with, right? No. It's black trim. So, anyways, black trim. Uh, let's see here. Rear seats. Actually, the seats on the Model S uh, get a new treatment. Ventilated seats. We'll get into some of the specifics. Uh, I've got a, a photograph here of the rear seats. Um, beautiful new uh, armrest that comes down with two beautiful cup holders in there and uh, the center console pointing towards the back. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Anyways, beautiful treatment on the interior. Um, obviously, the Model S finally got door pockets, not only in the front and the back. That's been a long standing issue with that car for like the last eight or nine years. How can you have a car that's supposed to be a family car and not have door pockets in it? Like, come on, guys. Anyway, so they finally got around to doing that. But the big treatment, of course, is the new dash, the new steering wheel, the new layout. Obviously, everything is reminiscent of the Model 3. So we now get a 2200 by 1300 pixel high definition, 17 inch horizontal screen. The S and the X get, uh, by the way, the same treatment on the interior of the car. So they still maintain um, the, the instrument panel uh, binnacle. However, um, those of you who have SNXs now with FSD are, are always <laughs> fighting a little bit with the, with the FSD, uh, screens, uh, taking up a lot of the, um, you know, the, the instrument the panel. It, it, yeah. And the steering wheel gets in the well. Well, Tesla got rid of the steering wheel. Basically they cut the steering wheel in half. So now we finally have a yoke, uh, which is kind of reminiscent of what Tesla did on the Roadster and the Cybertruck. Um, speaking of which I'm going to put this down here, obviously, the yoke that's going into the S and the X, that's going to make it on the Roadster. A lot of people were talking about, well, are they going to do it or not? Yeah, it's definitely. If they're doing it on these cars, it's going to happen on the Roadster. The big question, of course, is we saw the Cybertruck. It had a yoke as well. Um, are they going to do the same treatment on that? Uh, we've been having a little discussion with some friends online with uh, on Twitter, and our friend Mark Benton chimed in, and he says, I don't I don't want a yoke in the Cybertruck because of off-roading and so on and so forth, and I, I kind of agree with him with that. So I'm hoping that if Tesla does 
do something like that, that maybe they give us a choice. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I think it would be nice to have a choice. Uh, personally, I'm okay with the yoke and the roadster in the Model S, but I don't think it really has any place being in the Cybertruck. That's my personal opinion, though. Anyways, let's go back. Lots of stuff has changed in the car. Obviously, they have kept um, some of the wood treatment. Now, the wood treatment that they have is kind of like a dark walnut. Uh, maybe I should bring up the, um, the the Tesla configurator here. While while you're doing that, one of the things I in looking at the photos myself today and playing with the configurator, it is easy to argue whether we want to agree with it or not. It's easy to argue that the Model S interior with this refresh, essentially is a luxury version of the three and Y interior. Because for example, the door controls are almost identical in both vehicles. The center console has a very similar DNA. Um, the display, while it's a little bit more recessed into the dash has almost the same layout as does the three and Y. So there's a lot of things that we've seen that when there's a change in one vehicle, it's soon to follow elsewhere. When Model X first came out with its front fascia, well, there was the refresh that came into the Model S shortly after that, and they had a very similar front end. We're seeing it now with 3 and Y that a lot of those integrations have made their way into the new S and X refresh, which is not which is not unexpected, right? We know that number one, it helps with suppliers because you're using a lot of the same products uh, across the board. And number two, it just makes it so that you can, as a consumer, really make a fair comparison. How luxury brand do I want to go? Are we looking for entry level passenger car, which the three and Y can sort of give you? Now you have the luxury components that S and X give you that three and Y maybe don't. Yeah, I'm hoping with the S and the X interior treatment that they've done two things. Well, obviously the first one is that they've mirrored a lot of the creature comforts that they rectified in the S mm -hmm. uh, with the three and the Y. Um, right. So they brought those in. I I don't have a problem with the interior in those cars. I think it's very well designed. It's well thought out. I mean, yeah, exiting the buttons and stuff takes a little bit of, <laughs> you know, it's muscle memory for us now, but for new users, it's a little weird. Uh, but anyways, you get over that. Um, but I think the biggest thing, I think, in most people's minds was like, you know, are they going to improve the materials, right? If you've ever mm -hmm. seen the Lucid Air, <laughs> oh man, that's a luxury car. That's a beautiful car. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm hoping that they've taken some of the cues from that and really, you know, d done some nice things. There are some specs here we're going to go over with that that really go beyond kind of the looks. Um, anyways, I'm going to bring up the configurator here and we can go through some of this stuff. So the first thing you need to know about the S and the X is that the long range car gets a wood treatment as an accent. However, if you switch to a plaid uh, variant, it's carbon fiber. There are three colors to choose from. So you get the black interior, and of course you get the De Rigueur white for $2,000. I'm on the U.S. site, right? Yeah, okay, so $2,000. Um, so I'm looking at the regular car at this point. So you get a, like a little walnut color, and they've kept the uh, cream, which is, um, which is okay. Not my favorite, but I prefer the white personally. Um, however, if you go back and you choose, let me go pick the plaid car. We'll talk about some of the specs here in a second. I just want to go back to the interior. So as you can see here, no matter what color you pick now, it, the accent parts now are carbon fiber, kind of reminiscent of what they used to do back in the day before they did pre-packaging. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's quite nice there. I'm going to go back here and just point out a few things on the interior here. I, I know people can't see you right now, but we can talk about this. All right, so first things first, 17 inch display. It's 2200 by 1300 pixel resolution, ultra bright colors. Um, uh, now it tilts, doesn't it, Travis? Well, is it says a responsiveness. Yeah, it says here responsiveness and a left right tilt. So mm -hmm. I don't know what they mean by that. Maybe it does center. Uh, maybe it I, does. I think it, I think it pivots so that you can sort of face it towards the yeah, passenger. Yeah, you kind of missed that the first center, time, which is really cool if it yeah. does. <laughs> so they've uh, kept the obviously they kept the binnacle on there, and of course they've dealt with the uh, steering wheel. Let's talk about the steering wheel here real quick. Actually, before we do that, let me go on to the second part. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm there, jumping there's around. So, here. There's, there's so much news coming in that Trevor can't even so keep his head on. So much to talk about. Anyways. Uh, the other interesting thing is Tesla's added a third screen for passengers. It's an eight-inch um, wide screen at the back, and uh, they're really pushing this entertainment fun, uh, thing now. Um, now for passengers, so not only get USB ports, USB-C ports on the back, but uh, passengers in the back now uh, can enjoy playing some of the games wirelessly. So it supports wireless controllers now via Tesla Arcade. Uh, it's an eight-inch screen, and they claim up to 10 teraflops of processing power. 10 teraflops! Yeah! So it's basically That's the same crazy. performance as, like, a PS5. So they're not fooling around. Yeah. I don't know who they partnered with or what they're using here, but that's uh, that's quite nice. 
So um, this means that calling shotgun in an S means you want to grab the back seat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's talk about the center screen. Obviously, what, 17 what, inch. What's that? Quick, before we go on, yeah. I want to not lose this thought. What's interesting too is that we're seeing a lot more tactic design in the vehicle, right? We're seeing a lot less of the dials and buttons and and triggers and levers. We're seeing a lot more tactic, and that's the steering wheel is really a big indicator of that. Where there's no stock, there's literally no stocks. It's just a steering wheel, and then you have the buttons on it to control everything. Yeah. Even the hazard button um, for your hazard lights is now where the charging port is for your phones. Yeah is right there, you see the indicator light. So yeah. it's it's there, I think the engineers behind this were so smart to think about not only how can we reduce even further the number of gadgets and gizmos in the vehicle that require some kind of movement to more tactic, but also figuring out how to best lay them out in the car relative to their current location. Yeah, there's a lot of thought that goes into car design. Yeah, I don't mm -hmm. think people realize how much time they actually spend on this kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. A couple of other things I want to mention before we move on to some of the other interior bits. Obviously, the um, cabin-facing camera is obviously there. That's certainly made the case. I don't see any evidence of it here, but it would not surprise me that the visors now have the magnetic latches, much like the Y and the 3 do. Uh, Model X already has that, uh, but on the Model S, uh, it wouldn't surprise me they went to a metal clip on that front. Uh, let's talk about the center screen. So again, going back, one of the things I've noticed with the UI on here, it's very reminiscent of uh, the Cybertruck prototype. So I'm kind of surmising here, based on the graphics they put on here, if it, this is indeed what it's going to look at, like, um, that we will probably see version 11 pretty soon. So maybe that might make it out to the rest of the fleet. Some interesting stuff on there. It actually shows air quality on the top. So obviously these cars also have the, the uh, bioweapon defense mode uh, HEPA filter system. Mm -hmm. Uh, new steering wheel. Okay, so this one's pretty controversial. I've seen a lot of people talk about this. Uh, so first of all, you know, we've seen this before in the uh, Roadster, and there was a lot of speculation as to, you know, are they actually going to do the yoke thing in the Roadster? So it's pretty much been answered. They're doing it in the Model S. It's going to happen in the Roadster. Uh, the Roadster had two stocks, although now that we see this new steering wheel, which is actually, or the steering column itself, is stockless, um, so what they've done on this car is they've put um, buttons, essentially, on the left-hand side. If you zoom in on the picture, so I encourage you, if you haven't done it, go to the Tesla website, go to the Model S, go to the configurator, scroll down to the interior options, and you can see a button there that says details, and it brings up these little square panels where you can scroll through. Um, zoom in on the steering wheel, and you're going to see on the left-hand side there's two uh, buttons that are for the indicator, so you know left or right, depending which way you're going. There's also a button on there. It's very faint. Uh, but that's for the headlights or the high beams, I should say. And on the right-hand side, you have a dedicated button uh, for voice commands, and it looks like there's a couple others. I would surmise probably that on the same steering wheel, maybe on the right-hand side, it's hard to see here in the picture, but that's where the uh, drive selector will be, so you're you know, neutral in your park, uh, that type of thing. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty controversial, but, um, I, I like the look of it. I think the fact, I mean, they're being bold here, right? The fact that they actually chopped off the top so you can actually see the binnacle makes sense because if you're going to put the autopilot stuff on there on the S and the X, you gotta, you gotta figure it out. You gotta do something about that. So I don't know. Uh, we'll see in the real life how it actually um, turns out and how it works. Obviously the S and the X are now getting the model three airwave HVAC system treatment. I mean, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that they would eventually do that. It works phenomenally well. Uh, people love it, so it makes sense. It lowers the dash down too, which is quite nice, especially mm -hmm. on the uh, on these two cars. Because I don't know if you've sat in a Model S recently, but you know, coming from a Model Three, it feels kind of claustrophobic because the roof line comes, you know, where the windshield is, comes down quite a bit lower. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, obviously in a Model X, you've got that big windshield, but it, I mean, you're sitting a little higher off the ground. So the fact that they've actually dropped the uh, um, the instrument panel down is, is quite welcome as far as I'm concerned on there. Uh, let's see here. Some other specs that they've uh, talked about. New 22-speaker, 960-watt audio system. <laughs> oh, oh, I mean, we love the audio system in the 3 and the Y. And, well, you know, the S and the X have a very good one now, too. But now they've really upped the ante on this thing. How many does the 3 have? 14 speakers, right? Uh, no, isn't it? Yeah, 18, something like that? 17, 18? 
I think it depends on the trim. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I but I know some well, trims pre- do have 14. Yeah, the premium interior. Yeah. Anyways. It's the premium 14. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> 22 yeah. speakers, 960 watt. That's crazy. Um, also has new microphones that enable active noise canceling. That's a thing that people have been asking for uh, quite some time. So being able to do... Uh, to, do you know what... You guys know what noise canceling does, right? How it works? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I don't have to explain it. So maybe our viewers and our listeners also know too, and I won't explain it to them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, obviously, the Model S retains the all glass roof. Beautiful picture here. I'll bring this up so you guys can see it. So obviously, it still maintains the UV and the infrared blocking, which everybody's come to expect. That's a beautiful picture, by the way. That's really quite nice. All right. Let's talk about interior features. What else has changed? 17-inch um, screen. We talked about that. 12.3-inch uh, driver's display and the 8-inch second row display in the back. Computer with 10 teraflops of processing power. Wireless controller compatibility. Very welcome. A lot of people are asking for something like that. Ventilated front seats. Really nice. Everybody wants that. Tri-zone airwave cabin control uh, conditioning. HEPA filter system, obviously. Ambient lighting, tinted roof, blah, 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 blah. So it's looking really good on this front. I think I think they've done a great job on finally fixing what I thought was getting to be a little bit of a moribund interior on the cars. I think it looks phenomenal. Uh, you know, the big outlier, of course, is how's the steering wheel going to be in the real world? We'll see what that what that brings. But I think they um, I think they did a good job. What, what do you guys think? Are, are you are you liking so an, what you see? I have an answer to your visor question. Yes. The visors are not magnetic. Why? They're still, they're still standard visors. I, if you go to, um, if you do go to look at the interior options in the in the design studio, okay. you will see at the very top of the image, especially if your display is large enough, you'll see at the very top of the image the driver side visor. Yeah, and it's I just see a it. standard visor that clips in on one side. You'll see it. Well, I it's see there. a clip there, but the way that they've changed it on the on the three and the Y is that instead of having that fixed clip where the visor goes into. Um, it's half a clip and it's magnetic. So I can't really tell in this. In this uh, it's hard, it's hard. It's, yeah, it's hard to tell, but, it de- but it's definitely not like the Model S where it's always resting on the on the pillar and that you would swing it in when you need it. It's not like that. Well, I'm hoping they make it magnetic because that totally makes sense. Less things mm-hmm. to break. If I could just jump in, I just noticed something weird. I wanted to pick up uh, the same pictures that you're looking at, Trev, while we're, we're discussing yep. this. If you go to the Canadian site right now, the Model S, which was live with the new model mm-hmm. an hour ago, has now disappeared. <gasps> what? Yeah. Yeah. All Check right. it out. Hold that go, thought. Go hold to... that thought. Hold that thought. Because I was looking at it earlier just to get a, a, uh-huh. a, a caught. No, it's I'm, I'm gonna... looking at it. It's fine. Standard Canadian uh, price, Canada? long range Model S starts at... $114,990. Uh, scrolling down. I'm on the Canadian site. Next. Uh, pick my paint colors. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Scrolling down. I'm not down. making this up. I got Model 3, Model Y, Cybertruck, Firewall. That's it. So while you guys are trying to figure that part out, um, just looking at the configurator, long oh, range. Long Go range to the U.S. Flag. configurator, and then at the top, click U.S., and then switch it, and then it'll come up. No, yeah. you know what it is? It's not listed at the top anymore. You have to scroll down the page and then it's there. Ah, but go so, into the U.S. configure and switch over. Anyways, it's there. Fine. Trust Sorry. me. Carry on. <laughs> so here in the here in the U.S., uh, looks like that deliveries for the uh, long range mm-hmm. and plaid versions would be March of this year. Yep. Plaid plus would be late 2021. Yeah. Now what's interesting too is in looking at the the specs, the long range gives us 412 miles of range. Uh, which is impressive with the top speed of 155, 0 to 60, 3.1 seconds uh, with the new battery packs. Plaid gives you 390 miles, top speed of 200 with a just under two second 0 to 60. And then Plaid Plus, <laughs> this is amazing, <laughs> 520 miles of range minimum with a top speed of over 200 miles an hour with a 0 to 60, again, under two seconds. The fastest production vehicle being put on the roads today. So or at least as, will be on the road. As, as, our, as our friend uh, Ryan McCaffrey tweeted earlier, <laughs> just a few minutes ago, actually, yeah. Elon Musk, he's saying, uh, so I guess the Roadster is just going to be time travel now, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he brings up a good point, though, because what's happening with both the Roadster and, and the Model S, when you start looking at the weight of the, the S, like Brian pointed out, this thing weighs almost 5,000 pounds yeah. fully mm-hmm. loaded up. How the hell do you get it to 60 and under? Um, two seconds. And one of the problems we're going to run up against is you're at the limit of traction for street tires. Like if you want to go quicker, 
you need drag tires. Like you're not going to be able to yep. do this. You're 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 accelerating way beyond one G, which is more than the, the grip of the tires. So I think Ryan threw it out there for fun, but mm -hmm. he might not be far off saying, you know what, the SpaceX package might have to become standard. Otherwise, it's never going to be any quicker. It just can't get the grip. You, you yeah. literally need I, rocket I have to agree on that because if if you if you look at the the base Roadster, which is coming in at what two hundred thousand US, and then you got the Founder Series, which are fifty grand more. Mm -hmm. What are you getting for fifty grand? Like, what extra stuff are they going to build in there? We know that the powertrain is is tri motor. It is the plaid. Cup holders. You're going to get cup holders yeah, in the cup center holders console and a special paint uh, worth fifty yeah. grand. Well, <laughs> for one thing, it'll be a much quicker and more nimble handling oh, car yeah. because it's going to be a lot lighter. You know, we don't know the body well, construction is yet, but it's going to be a much. You know, you're talking about this much power, but in a car that's going to be lighter, a lot more nimble. So people want to go to the track. I think we're going to have well, a lot more fun. Uh, the other I, I know that the Plaid S will be a very cap capable track yeah. car, but if you want the sports car, you know, and, and to be honest, basically Falcon 9 versus Falcon Heavy, right? Like they're both going to get you up into space, but one's going to really yeah. get you there. Yeah. It, it's a conversation yeah. I've actually had with Ryan um, a little bit, well, publicly and privately last week. Um, you know, we're both of, on the same page here that we think the Roadster is going to end up being a completely carbon fiber body. Uh, if you're talking about a 200 kilowatt hour battery pack, assuming that that is still in the in play, could mm -hmm. be bigger. I don't know. Um, we're talking, you know, a couple thousand pounds for battery pack. You know, you got to keep a car fairly lightweight. So if you start, you know, slapping stuff on, a anyways, it and and it's that's not a precedent either because the original Roadster was all carbon fiber anyways, and it sold for cheaper. So you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, it's too cheap to have a carbon fiber. Yeah, okay, maybe if you're looking at a Bugatti Veyron or something like that, that's all carbon fiber. Yeah, okay, fine, but uh, you know, the carbon fiber is not as exotic as people think it is. No, no. I mean, you got to remember the original Tesla Roadster had a carbon fiber yeah. body and it was, what, 109,000 yeah. bucks. Um, when you start talking about very low production uh, volume cars, it starts to make sense because th there's not as much tooling cost. Like the dies and the stamping stuff that you need for body panels is big, big money. If you're going to build a, a couple hundred thousand cars, it's, it's peanuts. But when you're building 5,000 cars a year, you know, it's not such a bad deal to do it out of carbon. No, instead. I'm, I'm going to put my money on that, uh, that the, the, the body of, of the car will be carbon fiber. It just has to be. It just doesn't make any sense otherwise. Um, if it comes with the SpaceX package, yay me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I was actually debating. I was actually thinking about that. I mean, if I order the car and depending on how things go, mm, you know, is it exotic enough to actually spend the extra money and actually buy the SpaceX package? I was actually toying with the idea of maybe doing that. I don't know. We'll see what, what transpires. But um, anyways, to make it obvious here, if you look at the specs on the Model S on the Plaid car, I'm going to bring up the screen here so everybody can see again. Whoop. All right. As Eric had mentioned, the Plaid Model S is 0 to 60 in 1.99 seconds. Tesla sandbags these numbers a little bit too. All right. Uh, 1,020 horsepower, three motors, obviously. Carbon-sleeved rotors. And torque vectoring, which is that's on the plug, right? Yeah, that's on the plaid. No, I think the to get the carbon rotors, you need plaid plus. Correct me if I'm no, wrong. No, I'm looking at plaid right now. Clicked on it, carbon sleeved yeah. rotors, torque vectoring. Okay. On both of them, plaid right? plus. When you bring that up, uh, now says zero to 60 in less than 1.99 seconds. They don't tell you exact numbers. Quarter mile, less than nine seconds, 1100 plus horsepower. Three motors, carbon sleeve rotors, and torque vectoring. So, as Ryan has mentioned, you know, basically, Roadster is going to be time travel because it has to beat all these numbers, yeah. right? It is basically the Halo car. So, what those numbers are going to be, I don't know, man. Uh, you know, we've kind of surmised for some time, you know, with a with SpaceX package, you're probably hitting 1.5 seconds. You're cheating a little bit because you have to <laughs> at that point. Anyways, Oh, very exciting. Um, let's just quickly look at the Model X and just double Trev, check. I just, it's, it's 6.30, eh? I don't know if we're, uh, are yeah. we logging into the call? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Well, there's music right now, so I'm just going to turn this down a little bit. We will listen to some light, delicate music while like we go. I It gives us a little air of Yeah, fun. sure, of course. So let's uh, jump in. That's we are. We're yeah. a dignified show. <laughs> yes, we're dignified. Oh, I'm going to turn it down a little <laughs> That's bit. That's what more. I'm saying. It helps. <laughs> right. All right. Have we not, have we not had a, like, if we were to go back and archive all the different titles for the show that I came up with, you're going to realize very quickly this is not the music for our show. No, 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 no. Of course no, I not. Don't. No. This is, um, this is, this is, yeah. yeah. They're never 100% on time and for we, these And things. we've had PG-13 titles because we know off air I have some very inappropriate. <laughs> 
appropriate titles for our shows. Yes, exactly. Mm. Um, so I'm just going to jump into the Model X and just have a quick look at that car while we wait for Elon to get off his butt and get into the call. And of course, I'm on the Canadian site, which does some weird stuff. So let me get out that. of here with your Canadian site. Hey, take off, eh, loser? All right, uh, order now. <laughs> Having a quick look, uh, so long range on the Model X is coming in at 88,490. Got to be careful there because they throw in some incentives on there, too, so be careful about that. Um, let's go to purchase price. Yeah, 89, no, 89,990. Pardon me. Um, no plaid plus, just the plaid on this one. I'm coming in at uh, yeah. just a hair under $120,000. The specs are about the same. Two and a half seconds, zero to 60, 1020 horsepower, blah, blah, blah. Basically the same on that one. Oh, by the way, the Model X uh, has some new wheels. So, mm -hmm. um, Cyberstream wheels. These look really quite sharp. I like them. They're kind of a mix. It's, yeah. it's a mix of, yeah, of the, the, sport uh, wheel? the Model 3 Sport wheel. Exactly. It does, and, yeah. And the old turbines, yeah. yeah I, mm -hmm. I thought it was a beautiful mashup, yeah. i got to say, as a wheel Yeah, guy. I'm really they, they, digging this new job. look. Yeah, so that's yeah. the 20-inch, and then they have an optional 22-inch turbine wheel, which I'm not quite as crazy about. They seem to have this thing about making the... Um, the edge is a little thicker. I don't know Ladies if it's plastic inserts. Oh, our Carl is starting. Let's listen and welcome in. Welcome to Tesla's Q4 2020 financial results and Q&A webcast. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference Here over to your again. speaker, Mr. Martin Vieca, Senior Is Director of Investor guys? Relations. Please go oh, ahead, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay, good. She Thank should be the voice of the roadster. Everyone. Uh, welcome to Tesla Sports yeah. Quarter 2020 Q&A webcast. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Zachary Kirkhorn, and a number of other executives. Our Q4 results were announced at about 1 p.m. Pacific time in the update deck we published at the same link as this webcast. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Actual events or results could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent filings with the SEC. During the question and answer portion of today's call, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Uh, please press star one now if you'd like to join the question queue. But before we jump into Q&A, Elon has some opening remarks. Elon? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so just to recap the year, uh, 2020 was a defining year for us on many levels. Despite a challenging environment, we reached an important milestone of producing and delivering half a million cars. Uh, I'd just like to uh, once again thank the people of Tesla for an incredible effort. Uh, we, we delivered uh, almost as many cars last year as we produced in our entire history. Uh, so really uh, an incredible uh, growth rate uh, and, and despite a very challenging uh, 2020. So when, when my hat is off. Uh, it's such an honor to work with such great people at, at, at Tesla. So, um, and for the year, we, we, so we achieved free cash flow of nearly $2.8 billion after spending more than $3 billion on building new factories and other expenditures. Uh, we reached in industry-leading gap operating margins in addition to positive net income and record cash flow. Regarding capacity expansion, um, we, we, while we focused on execution, we, we continued to build a lot of new capacity. We started producing the Model Y out of three months and have almost reached full production speed. We, we ramped the Model 3 in Shanghai to more than 5,000 uh, cars a week sustainably, uh, and Shanghai continues to grow uh, rapidly. We introduced the heat pump to all of our vehicles. We ramped the single piece, we, we, we started and, and we almost ramped to, to uh, volume uh, production, uh, the single piece castings for Model Y. This is where, uh, for the first time in history, the entire rear third skeleton of the, of the car is being cast as a single piece in the largest and most advanced casting machine ever made. Uh, we built the Model Y factory in China from start to finish in one year. We're also building Giga Berlin and Giga Texas, which we expect to start production later this year. And lastly, we built a, um, a, cell, a, a battery cell uh, factory in the Bay Area. Uh, and this, even though it is a pilot plant, it is, its capacity is um, large enough that it would 
be in the probably the top 10 uh, battery cell factories on Earth, despite being a pilot plant. Uh, regarding the new Model X, S and X, um, we are launching the, we're super excited to announce the new Model S and Model X Plaid uh, are in production now and will be delivered in February. So we've, we've been able to bring forward the, the Plaid uh, Model S and X, and uh, so Model S will be delivered in February and Model X a little later. The Model S Plaid, in, we're actually in production now and we'll be, we'll be delivering uh, next month. Uh, so this is a tri-motor uh, Model S with a completely new interior. Uh, there, there, there are actually a lot of great things about this. I'll do another call about the, the Model S later, uh, but uh, it, it's really um, a, a tremendous uh, improvement um, over the prior version. Uh, and the Model S will be the first, this Model S Plaid will be the first production car ever that is able to go zero to 60 miles an hour in under two seconds. So no, no production car ever has been able to get below two seconds, zero to 60. This is a, a, a luxury sedan that is able to go zero to 60 uh, in less than two seconds. Uh, and uh, we'll have the ability to seat up to seven people with the, the third row uh, seats. So Ooh, they're bringing that back. This is pretty nuts. This is faster to be clear than any car. It's not like there was a different type of car, like a two-door sports car that was able to do better faster than this. This is the fastest accelerating car ever made for that is allowed to go on roads in history. Um, and like I said, we'll start delivering it you know, in a matter of weeks. Um, yeah, and just, you know, the, the, and like I said, we'll, I'll, I'll do some uh, gets into details of all the uh, less changes. Um, uh, maybe later this week or next, uh, but it, it's it's really better in in, in many ways. Uh, any, we'll be, any we'll be that has the heat pump raising the price of Model S uh, for the new model. He said they all do now. People the old model, the, the new model will be ten thousand dollars more. So hopefully people aren't too upset if they bought the old model last month, but this one's ten k more. Um, so yeah, so price increase is warranted. Yeah, we think it's probably the best car of any kind at any price available in the world today. So, um, then with regards to full self-driving, um, we've made massive progress on full self-driving. I recommend watching the videos of our uh, public beta. So we've got, I think, almost a thousand people in the, in the beta at this point. And uh, it, with each successful release of the beta of the FFD software, it just gets, it's really improve, improving uh, rapidly. Uh, it's not it's not very common for um, you know I, I drive latest so it's very common for me to um, have no intervention uh, on drives that I do including drives to places I've never been to so these, these are not pre-planned routes they're cars the cars I've never been there before and uh, it, it's not actually more more it, 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 it's more common than not for the car to have no intervention even on a complex drive. So, uh, and and this is like basically, I'm highly confident the car will drive itself with the reliability and access of human this year. Uh, this is a very big deal. Um, and, and and thinking about like, you know, how does one justify the, the value of the company being where it is? Um, and I think there is a way, just with back of the envelope map, to potentially justify it, uh, where. You know, if Tesla ships, let's say, hypothetically, um, 50 or $60 billion worth of vehicles, and those vehicles become full self-driving and can be used in a rover taxi, uh, use as rover taxis, their utility uh, increases from an average of 12 hours a week to potentially an average of 60 hours a week uh, if, they're, um, if, they're, if they're capable of serving as a rover taxi. So that's like roughly a 5x uh, increase in utility. Um, but but, but let's, if, even if you say like okay, well, let's just assume that the car becomes twice as useful as uh, it, it, not not five times useful, but merely twice as useful. That would be a, a doubling again of the revenue of the company, um, which is in, you know almost entirely um, gross margin. So it would mean it, it would be like okay, if you 
made fifty million fifty billion dollars worth of cars and they're like having fifty billion dollars of incremental profit, basically, from that because it's a soft it's a software. So um and if, if that were the case then yeah, if you do twenty P E on that, it's like a trillion dollars. Um and the company's sort of high growth work. So I think there is a way to sort of like you know, justify the valuation of the company where it is, uh, using just the cars and nothing else. Uh, cars with FSD. Um and I, 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 I suspect at least a number of investors are uh, taking that approach. Um, so in, in conclusion, um, while 2020 was a turning point for Tesla and in terms of uh, profitability, uh, we believe this is just the beginning. Uh, we think 2021 is going to be uh, even more exciting and, and, you know, you don't know what to expect in a given year, obviously. <laughs> Last year we did not have any many things we do not expect. Um, but assuming that 21 is a relatively normal year from an external standpoint, um, I think we're, it's going to be a great year for Tesla. Um, we've got a ton of, you know, many great new products coming out. Uh, we've got factories that are, um, advanced factories that have been set up, uh, production, um, it will also make it easier having, having a factory in, in, in Berlin, one in, in Texas that can, just from a logistics standpoint, in Texas can help supply the eastern half of the U.S., and uh, Berlin can help supply Europe, um, and there's just fewer cars on boats, uh, much less capital tied up you know, with the cars that are you know, on boats or going, uh, being transported to customers. Uh, and I think the fundamental efficiency of the company um, will be much better uh, with the factories, or at least having factories on, on each continent and having two factories in the U.S. So I'm, I'm super excited about the future, um, and uh, yeah, really look forward to making that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I think uh, uh, our CFO, Zach Kirkhorn, has some opening remarks as well. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, as Elon mentioned, 2020 has been an extremely successful year while managing through many unforeseen and unexpected challenges. On cash, we continue to generate strong free cash flows, reaching a record $1.9 billion in Q4, alongside growth and investment for future programs. Additionally, we've been able to reduce our use of debt and various working capital lines, including settling $2 billion of convertible debt in Q4, which will continue into Q1. For net income, we achieved our first calendar year and six sequential quarters of profitability. In addition, auto gross margin excluding credits improved from 2019 to 2020 despite reductions in ASP and inefficiencies for new product launches and transitions. On Q4 specifically, this was a noisy quarter, so let's unpack a few things. Stock-based comp increased, part of which is driven by the rise of the stock price over the course of our 2020 employee performance grant process, and a portion of which is unique to Q4 only. The impact of SBC increases is seen um, across both COGS as well as operating expenses. Automotive gross margin in Q4 was primarily impacted by two things. First, we invested in improving our products built in Fremont, including converting over to the new Model S and Model X, launching the single-piece castings on Model Y, and introducing heat pump on Model 3. Second, logistics and labor costs were impacted due to supply chain instability and pandemic inefficiencies. Adjusting for items such as these, as we do in our internal management views, we saw an improvement in auto gross margin. Our services and other P&L was impacted by many of the same factors just mentioned, including onboarding costs associated with new service capacity. However, what's most important here is that we've accelerated the growth in service capacity and will continue to drive capacity expansion as fast as possible. On energy gross margin, we saw an impact from solar roof-related ramp costs and typical seasonality in the lease PPA business. OPEX as a percentage of revenue continues to reduce despite impacts from items mentioned, as well as increased investment in development of future products. Finally, the early settlement of our convertible notes resulted in an additional $100 million of interest expense for the quarter. All that being said, nothing has changed about our view that operating margin will continue to grow and remain industry-leading. As we look forward, 2021 may be our most meaningful step forward yet, as we see the benefits of long-standing investments in capacity and technology. The range of possible outcomes this year is wide, given the magnitude of launches. Thus, a few things we should keep in mind. 
We continue to expect a long-term volume CAGR of 50%, of which we may materially exceed this in 2021. As we increase production rates, volumes will skew towards the second half of the year, and ramp inefficiencies will be a part of this year's story and are necessary to achieve our long-term goals. Specifically for Q1, our volumes will have the benefit of early Model Y ramp in Shanghai. However, S and X production will be low due to the transition to the newly re-architected products. Additionally, we're working extremely hard to manage through the global semiconductor shortage as well as port capacity, which may have a temporary impact. We will continue to invest heavily in supercharging and service capacity while driving reductions on costs, including OPEX as a percentage of revenue. Global demand continues to outpace production, and we're moving as quickly as we can with a focus on the long term. I look forward to providing updates on progress throughout the year. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we can jump straight into questions from say Technologies. The, the first question from institutional investors is, uh, what is currently holding Tesla back from being the market share leader in solar? Yeah, so uh, we're actually seeing tremendous growth in solar uh, quarter over quarter last year. And um, we had uh, our best quarter since, I think, 2018 in Q4. So we, we, we do actually expect to become the market share leader in solar and, and then go far beyond that. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there were a few years there where we, we, we had to devote the whole company to uh, Model 3 production um, and, uh, you know, and, and you know, building. It, 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 we had to basically take the whole company to a bunch of people that were, were on solar uh, and have work on cars. But now, uh, we, now we've got a little bad with. We're putting a lot of attention on solar, and it is growing rapidly. So. I think it will not be long before Tesla is by far the market leader in solar. They just going to expand that really the important US. part of the solar strategy is uh, achieving an industry-leading cost structure, which then allows us to have industry-leading pricing. And so that's something that uh, that we've accomplished over the last year in terms of getting the cost structure in the place that it needs to be. Uh, and you know, as you all mentioned, this is a really important part with industry-leading pricing to become the leader in the space. Yeah, and actually, an important part is um, achieving better integration between the Tesla Powerwall and the Tesla retrofit solar and Tesla roof. Um, and we're confident we'll have excellent integration, uh, excellent, excellent integration with the, um, with the Powerwall and, and, and Tesla solar, whether it's retrofit or. Um, the, the top solar class roof um, before the end of the year. So it's it's really I think we've got a good strategy. Uh, as Zach mentioned, we're um, we're focused on reducing the amount of time and the complexity of the infill, and we're making great progress in that regard. Um, and I think we'll we'll have something that's really dialed in um, this year. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, uh, could current owners get ability to transfer their FSD to their next vehicle? Yeah, right. This would be a huge yeah. loyalty and yeah. overall increased sales of vehicles while are offering more FSD sales on used vehicles. All right, here we go. Uh, unfortunately, we're not considering that at this time. Yeah. Um, we do actually offer an increase, uh, a higher price than for, for a car with FSD than the one without FSD. Um, and I do think that the mob currently undervalues or the, both the consumer market and, and, and arguably the stock market does probably undervalue the, uh, just how good FLC is going to be. Um, but we're not, not currently planning on, on offering, on allowing it to get transferred. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Raj. We will be offering description pretty soon. Yeah, in the well, the subscription thing. Yeah. So that, that should address a lot of people's concerns for being able to get it. Thank you very much. Uh, and the third question is, uh, can you give us a progress update on dry coating of the battery electrode? At the battery day, Elon said, I would not say this is completely in the bag, as uh, yet as the yields were low. Andrew? Yeah, um, sure. It's true, the, the in-house cell manufacturing system we revealed at battery day contains uh, new processes and equipment, so we did expect some unknown unknowns and technical challenges to arise through the production range. Uh, the Cato team, however, has been able to solve each manufacturing problem presented to date and continues to improve 
yield and rate week over week and month over month as we move up the production S curve. Um, at the same time, the cell engineering team's refined designs and deepened understanding has reinforced our confidence in the drive process and 46A design, meeting our performance and cost targets. Um, and from a capacity perspective, we have 10 gigawatt hours worth of equipment landed at Cato. The production staff is nearly all hired. Our material supply chain is established and the team is on track for full production ramp this year. Meanwhile, we've developed enough engineering confidence with our 4680 design and the production process and equipment to kick off manufacturing equipment and facility construction to support our 100 gigawatt hour 2022 goal. Nice. nice. We like to hear those okay. kind of things. Thank you very much. 1.21 gigawatts. Yep. <laughs> uh, why are you confident Tesla will achieve level five autonomy in 2021? And why is Dojo not necessary to get there? Good question. Um, I, I guess I'm confident based on uh, my understanding of the tech roadmap um, and the, the progress that we're making between uh, each beta iteration. Um, yeah. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's now not, it's not remarkable at all for the car to completely drive you from one uh, location to another through a series of complex intersections. Um, it's, it's now about just improving the corner case reliability um, and getting it, to, you know, to 99.99% you know, reliable uh, with respect to uh, an accident. Basically, better, we need to get it to better than, uh, than human by a factor of at least 100% or 200%. Um, and uh, but this is happening rapidly because we've got so much training data uh, with, with all the cars in the field. And um, the, the software is improving dramatically. The, we also write the, the software for, uh, for late lane. Um, and I'll say it is quite challenging. We're, we're moving everything towards, to, towards video late lane. So it's, all video labeling, all video inference. And um, so there, there's still a few of the neural nets that need to be upgraded to uh, for, uh, video uh, training and video, and video inference. Um, and really, as we as we transition to each net to um, to video, uh, the, the performances become exceptional. Um, so th this is like a hard thing with the video. The, 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 the labeling software that we wrote for video labeling, um, making that better has a huge effect on the uh, efficiency of labeling. Uh, and then, of course, the holy grail is auto labeling. Um, so we're doing a lot of work into and having the labeling tool be more uh, efficient when used by a person, as, as well as uh, enabling auto labeling where we can. Uh, it, it dojo, uh, it's a for training supercomputer. I uh, would believe it will be, we, we think it may be the best uh, neural net training computer in the world by possibly an order of magnitude. Um, Elon's favorite so words. It is, a, it is a whole thing in and of itself. Um, and this is something we could offer potentially as a service. Uh, so uh, if somebody, if others need neural net training, it, it, you know, we're not trying to keep it to ourselves. Um, so this, I think this thing, this thing that could be uh, it's a whole line of uh, business in and of itself. Um, and then, of course, for training vast amounts of video data uh, and getting the, um, the reliability from, say, 100% to 200% better than an average human to 2,000% to, to better than an average human, so it will be very helpful in that regard. I'm really glad someone could ask about Thank the you. new administration. Yeah, no uh, the updates on the what is it, wide release of our run rate of the 4680 cell production. How do you see this run rate evolving by mid 2021 or end of 2021? Fine Lab has aligned protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. 
Fine Lab and Tesla. We were meant for each other. Yeah, I think we, we kind of talked about that through. Uh, I mean, essentially what, what we're saying is that um, the, the number to think about folks on is like we have, we've got a 100 gigawatt hour total that uh, Tesla cells produced in 2022. Um, it, it's not that important to look at the, the run up to that because these the, the things tend to improve exponentially. Uh, but we are installing capacity for, it, it, you know, in 2022 for 200 gigawatt hours a year. And we think probably um, we, sh we should be able to achieve 50% of, of targeted design capacity uh, in 2022. Yeah. Yeah, agreed, Elon. And as you said before, with the S-curve of production, um, you can be off a little bit on the initial part of the S curve and that makes a difference in absolute capacity by quite a bit one month to the next. So yeah, I mean, we're, we are progressing up that S curve as fast as we possibly can. Yeah. And we, and we don't see any showstoppers. So. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, and one more question is from uh, retail investors. Uh, what is Tesla doing to improve service experience? Tesla had a reputation for outstanding customer service. Now it's ooh. possible to even call a service center ooh, and appointments ooh, are scheduled burn. to be out. <laughs> Asking for, the good questions. Yes. Um, well, for I would ask service, about pain. No service. So we, uh, we spent a lot of efforts trying to improve the quality and the reliability uh, of our Mr. cars. Guyet. In the last two years, um, the um, frequency of service visits are reduced by one third. So um, people have to, uh, customers have to come less frequently in the service, which is really the goal, no service. And if um, service has to take place, we're trying to make it as painless as possible. Uh, one big effort there is to increase mobile service, which is now more than 40% of all visits in North America. We're trying to push that to 50% uh, this year. Um, in 50% um, of service uh, visits, uh, last less than two hours. Uh, so we're trying to service the cars very quickly so people can get their vehicles back on the road. And uh, in terms of service appointment, um, it, it continues to improve. We have about, uh, we have actually 140 service centers right now in North America. For 100 out of those 140, uh, you can get appointments in less than 10 days. And we're going to make sure it's all service centers uh, are um, have a short wait time. Uh, we're accelerating, as uh, Zach mentioned earlier, the pace of opening. We, in North America, we open 11 uh, centers in December, and we have uh, plans to open 46 in the first half of this year. So that's what we're doing to improve service. Uh, in terms of phones, uh, our uh, emphasis is on the app. Uh, really, we want all communications to go through the app, the Tesla app, uh, and we're trying to move away from the phone. The app is much better than the phone. Um, it can spot directly alerts directly from the car and schedule a service appointment. And there is a re written record of all communication uh, between the customer and the service team. You can have pictures in there. You can take care of your payment without entering the credit card and doing all that stuff. Uh, you get updates on the service, and there's even more uh, features that are going to come uh, in the coming month on the app, and that I think everybody will be happy, including the ability to spot uh, where your service technician is and uh, how far it is to, to come in from your car and what's going on there. That's cool. So we are investing everything on the I app, I think just like most other companies as well, and that's the way of the future. Thank you very much. Now let's go to institutional investor questions. The question number one, what are the key milestones we need uh, to achieve in order to evolve current FSD to a commercial level four, level five ride sharing solution? The government. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it, it really goes back to what I was saying uh, a moment ago, which is we need to transition all the neural nets in the car to um, a video. Um, and in order to to do that, the whole, the whole stack has to be so uh, stack has to be changed to video. So that means that, uh, gathering video clips, uh, then using and, and this is actually surround video. So you've got eight cameras operating simultaneously um, um, with, with you know the, that with, with synchronized frame rates. So you've got uh, uh, basically eight frames surround video, um, eight, eight cameras surround video. Um, and then 
you've got to label um, basically everything in that in that video a, a, a snippet, and and then train against that, and then have those neural nets operate the car. Uh, so, um, um, and, and this is coming from the past where we would label the neural nets would be a single camera, single frame. Uh, so no, no video and not, and not combining the cameras. Um, and, and then we work from single frame, uh, single frame, one frame at a time, one camera at a time, neural nets to surround camera, um, you know, that's where it would look at all at images from all eight cameras, but but only one frame at a time. Uh, and now to where we include the time dimension, uh, and that's that's video. Yeah, we so we're going to get 360 degree um, bird's eye view for parking. Uh, it would really just see this as a question awesome. of, of getting work done. We're getting it done, and you can see the results in the um, rapid improving so FSD the beta years. that are released. And we're, we're also going to be expanding the FSD, FSD beta itself to include. Uh, more and more people. Um, so, and from my standpoint, it looks Canada? A, a, like a very clear and obvious path towards uh, a vehicle that will drive, you know, 100 percent safer than a person. Um, yeah, I really don't see any obstacles here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the second question from institutionals is, does Tesla plan uh, or expect to license the calm down. Yeah, that, that's, he's just bringing energy tonight. He needs to calm down. And auto beta in particular to third-party OEMs. I think we're very open to licensing our software to to third parties. Um, and we've had yeah, some... Good luck getting anybody to bite um, on that. Though. ...preliminary discussions about licensing autopilot to other OEMs. Not so, invented here. Uh, this is something we're, we're more than happy to do. Um, and uh, you know, but I think also we, like we need to probably do a little bit more work to prove that Tesla autopilot is capable of full self driving, um, which I, I, just, I think will become obvious later this year. Uh, and then we're more than happy to uh, license that to other car companies. We're, we're definitely not trying to keep it uh, to be a Tesla exclusive situation. Um, and I think that probably the same goes for Autobitter. We haven't thought as much about Autobitter, but. Um, the, the Tesla philosophy is definitely not to create uh, walled gardens. Um, you know, we're, we're going to allow the companies to use our supercharger networks um, and, uh, yeah, using our autonomy software and order better and perhaps other things uh, would be fine too. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, key differences in product customer preferences, FSD strategy between China and the rest of the world. Do we need to do things differently to win the Chinese EV market? Well, we currently are winning the. We are currently the leader in the Chinese EV market. So, um, so I think we're we must be doing something right if we're the best-selling um, electric car in China. Um, that said, a uh, very few of our customers in China, I think it may be as low as one or two percent actually have selected the FSD uh, option. This is much lower than the rest of the world. Um, mm. So you know, we um, definitely need to make, make it work well in China. I think so if it works well in China, then we will have a uh, take rate for FSD. Um, I find the, 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 the customers in China, uh, tail owners in China, are among the most concerning in the world. Um, they, their attention to detail is, is incredible. So. Um, they, 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 that means they will, the quality is better in China. <laughs> um, Buy FSD as soon as it is working well in China, and and yeah, hopefully that is later this year. They gotta fix the paint in Fremont. My Thank God. you. Uh, and the next question is: Is it fair to argue that the best way to think about companies' long-term earnings power is uh, is tied to profit per unit of battery capacity? Uh, three terawatt hours target from battery day implies half of long-term battery capacity goes to storage, depending on what you assume for pack size on Elon's 20 million uh, vehicle unit goal. Um, yeah, no, it is. So the, the, the fundamental limit on electric vehicles right now, in general, is to availability of um, of cells. Uh, what's the output of battery cells in, in, in gigawatt hours? Um, and you can't grow faster than that. 
Um, now, a Tesla, we've improved the efficiency of our cars dramatically such that you can actually get a pretty good range even with a standard range battery pack. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, in the high, two, it's approaching, the, for Model 3, it's approaching the sort of high 200s. Um, and, with, you know, with some slight continued improvements, we'll start to get to, you know, 300 mile range, even with a standard pack and, you know, on order of 500 kilometers. So, um, there's efficiency improvements in the car, but fundamentally, the growth is dependent on uh, cell production. Um, and um, there's also a lot of other, other companies that want to, that have a need for cells. So, the, but the reason Tesla is doing its own cell production is in order to accelerate the growth. Um, it is not, it is not to, to make less use of our cell suppliers. In fact, I want to be really clear. Tesla wants to increase purchases from cell suppliers. And we've been very clear with our cell suppliers, uh, you know, whether it be CATL or Panasonic or uh, LG, that we will take as many batteries as they can produce. So, and we, we urge them to increase their uh, production and we will buy as much as they can send to us. Um, now obviously, there, there's some price limits on that because the cars will need to be affordable. Um, but it, it, I'm just trying to be as clear as possible that our goal with uh, making our own cells is not to uh, disintermediate our suppliers, it is to supplement our suppliers. And we want our suppliers of cells to increase their production and, in addition, have our production that is simply taking up the amount beyond which they are um, either unable or unwilling to increase their production. Um, so there's an acceleration over and above what the most that our suppliers say they can produce for us. Do you know what FSD um, costs so, in China? Probably the, no. 64,000 yen, the, which is like $614 output, here in the US. What? Yeah. Um, and nobody's taking the, it. Yeah, and, and, and then, you, I mean, it, it, probably the board brush of value of, of Tesla is just what's the cell output that implies vehicle output, and then at least double that for the autonomy, autonomy revenue, um, probably more than double. Um, and that, that's how you figure out the value of the company, I think, long term. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is about 4680 cells, which we already covered in the, the retail section of this call. Uh, so let's go straight to the last question uh, from institutional investors, which is, where are you in Cybertruck development? Uh, what are your expectations for Cybertruck deliveries in 2021? Excellent. That's what I want to know. All right. So we, we finished yes. um, uh, all, all of the Cybertruck uh, in engineering. So we're no longer iterating at the design center level uh, or design level. We, we've got the design fixed. Um, we're um, getting to, uh, you know, we'll see an order of the equipment necessary to make the fiber truck work. We're actually going to be using even a bigger casting machine for the rear body of the fiber truck because you've got see, a bigger vehicle and you've got a long uh, truck bed that's going to support a lot of load. So we'll be using an 8,000 ton casting press uh, for the rear body casting as opposed to a 6,000 ton for uh, Model Y. Um, so 6,000 ton was the biggest casting press in the world. 8,000 ton, I'll see. Quite a bit bigger than that, and uh, I think it's going to be an incredible vehicle. Um, if we get lucky, we'll we'll be able to do a few deliveries towards the end of this year, uh, but I expect volume production to be in 2022. Yeah. Thank you very much, and now we can start with uh, questions in the uh, in the queue. Thank you. Our first question will come from Colin Rush with Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Thanks so much, guys. Can you talk a little bit about the regulatory environment for FSD and, and how you're seeing that play out? Obviously, it's a, a bit of a moving target right now, and, and you guys are leading the way here, but we'd love to understand how those conversations are going and how you see that impacting the rollout of FSD uh, throughout the balance of this year and into next year. Should we continue to listen to this, or do we want to talk? No. No? Um, okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we'll let that one go for a little bit. All right. <laughs> um, I always enjoy more of the uh, retail investor questions because they seem to be a little bit more pointed, 
a little bit more relevant to to most of us. Um, any takeaways from what we actually heard, guys? Just just before we get going, I, I want to correct quickly on uh, Eric's observation because that blew my mind for a second. But uh, the yuan to U.S. dollar ratio is 0.15. So when I do the conversion, it's about 10,000 U.S. Oh, for FSD. Um, I just Did think Google you, let me down. No, it's a shame. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I, I just because it 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 rung funny. It seems to me in my mind, it's like when we talk about it at work, it's around a six to six to one ratio or something. So it's about the same price. But you know, I. It, it blows my mind that they're they're only a one percent take rate, but because that's the best R and D facility on Earth for FSD. If your car can drive itself in China, it can go anywhere. I mean, it would it'd be able to climb mountains. I mean, it's the most insane driving environment I've personally ever been in. I mean, if if it can do that, oh, so it's too bad that they're not yeah. getting those experience there. It's it's it's. I think the percentage is what it really hits home, right? Like you hear that number, like that yeah. sounds extremely low, but but again, this ties into I think the second question that came in on the call tonight which is, hey, can FSD be transferable so that way the value goes along in the vehicle? And Elon pointed out some of the complexities as to why that's difficult and why they're sort of not doing that right now. But that's also why people may not be springing for it because it depends how long you're going to have your car. Are they more leases and sales? Um, I mean, there's, I mean, you can say, hey, we've delivered X number of cars, but they don't typically break down how many deliveries are leases versus yeah. flat out loans or ownership yeah. right yeah. so so it could be that if you're leasing the car you're not getting fsd um if you're buying the car but you're like i want to get into electric but i'm not sure i can afford to go full i mean listen asking a person now to spring 10 grand for fsd when you're hearing tonight on the call hey it may not be something that really is an intrinsic value that ties to the car or you you kind of go that's a really big investment to make then when we're not able to really see the full-fledged benefits yet we're seeing inclinations we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of great um videos and a lot of tutorials are coming from this right now but again it's you're asking someone to make an investment that is not a full-fledged investment that they can materialize right now just get in the car and just go yeah. hey i want to get some chipotle and then all of a sudden boom you're just you're back at home again um so that could be part of the equations that people are doing in their head to figure that out. Um, but you're right, that market, like we know how traffic driven uh, Chinese roads are. And it would make sense that if you're getting it, that's the ultimate test is there. Um, yeah. But again, there's a lot of factors that play into why they're not getting it. Yeah. Now, Eric and I had that conversation a little bit earlier today about FSD and, you know, in anticipation for this question coming up as far as transferability is concerned. And you know, you know, the, the conversation had come up where it's like, well, what if you get in a crash and then you have to buy a new, another car? I mean, it's not transferable. You have to buy it all over again. And if the insurance companies, let alone Tesla, is not attributing a value to it, mm -hmm. like it's 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 money. It's gone. Right. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are looking at it. I mean, it, also, it's it's an intangible. Right. It's not like you can go and take a spoiler off the car or take your wheels off yeah. that you bought. Um, it's it's very much something you can't touch and feel, right? So I think but there's some it, reticence in a lot of people to actually spend the money there. I think, though, you know, it's like everything else Tesla does, where, it, where they're breaking the rules or we're oh, on the yeah. dawn of a new age where insurance companies are going to have to assign a value to these software features because they may be the first, but they won't be the last. You're going to see mm -hmm. a lot of other OEMs going to this type of model. And they're going to have to allow for it, you know. So if it's not transferable, uh, you're going to have to make sure that there's a rider in your insurance that covers it. Because yeah, yeah. You, you could be out ten grand. Yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> if that happens, and, and you know? I called my insurance company to inform them that I that I had purchased it. Uh, yeah. You know, and they said, okay, what does that mean at the end of the day, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, in our case, since we migrated from from EAP, uh, or no, wait a minute. Did you, you had it, did you, did you buy no, it No, I bought, Jeff? I bought everything right, right from the beginning. Bought it was front. Like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it was the Model X that I bought FSD when they had the fire sale for that short one month or three, yeah. three week period. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, I, I think of this as really two different examples. Number one is if you were to um, do any other aftermarket mod on your vehicle, you add a spoiler, you do a vehicle wrap, anything like that. If your vehicle is totaled, those aftermarket mods are not factored in your insurance settlement. No, of course right? Not. It's the value of the vehicle. It's, depends. depends with, the company. I, I've had with, stuff right. covered. No, no, no. no. But, but by and large, at least I can it's tell you, your, it's not automatic, right? So you're not guaranteed if I spend $5,000 in aftermarket mods that you're guaranteed that's going to factor into the cost of the vehicle. Now, certain things may be, yeah. 
but other things may not be like if you install a safety improvement maybe that would work but otherwise if you're like hey i lowered my car okay great that's, not, that's you know <laughs> especially if they consider the work you did is what led to the accident but that i digress <laughs> that sounds now, like a dig <laughs> right now let's let's just say um aside from that if you have a computer and you buy licensed software and that license is tethered to that computer you sell the computer, it breaks, you give it away, whatever. You can't then go to the software company and say, hey, I want another copy of that software. That software and that computer were tethered together as a single unit. So to me, while we're looking at FSD as in a cloud-based sort of solution, right? Like, hey, if I order this, it just downloads and I have it. It is literally just that. It's no different than buying a licensed application for your device. And it's only that device. Now, we could argue that, well, apps for mobile devices, if I have it on my account, if I get a new phone, then and my account's on that phone, then I can get all those apps again. But I, th I think they look at FSD as something more grandeur as Office you know, 97 versus the way that we're seeing now, which is a lot of cloud-based stuff as, as far as software or as a solution. So um, I, I think, and, and Trevor and I alluded to this earlier, it, there is a lot of good merits to the argument that FSD should be, because of the cost to the consumer, should be transferable, should equate to the value, or should be included in the value of the car. But if also, if I'm selling the car to another person and they're not interested in FSD, do they want to now have to pay $10,000 for something that they may never want or never use? So it's, it goes both ways. You're not, you, you don't wanna force a person into a situation they don't wanna have to be into, but at the same time, you, the consumer, that's, an, that's a, an investment risk you're making, no different than buying a stock. If the stock goes up, then great, you made out. But if it goes down, well, that's the risk you took in making the investment. I'll say one thing, though. If you go to sell your Tesla right now, I guarantee you that every buyer is going to approach you, and whether you advertise it or not, are going to ask you, does it have FSD? Much like... You yep. know, if you bought a car, did it come with autopilot at the time when it was optional, right? This yep. is this is one of those items that people will attach some kind of value to. How much? I don't know because, like I said, it's, you know, some people look at it as a loss leader or, um, or sunk cost, I should say. You know, you put wheels in the car. Well, I'm not giving you any money for that. It's worth nothing to me, right? What are you going to do? Take them off? So uh, I, the other thing, too, I, I'm, I'm hoping that when they do get around to doing the uh, licensing or licensing, I should say, the subscription model, that they would kind of do what um, and what Eric was suggesting is that it's tied to a vehicle. But I would like to see it as a floating license in the sense that, let's say I own two Teslas, and I'm only driving one most of the time, and I only pay for FSD on one. I'd like it to be able to be transferable in the sense that, okay, today I'm driving this car, sign into my profile. They, uh, Tesla and Elon have mentioned that eventually they want to take the driver profiles in the car and put them up onto the cloud. It makes sense, you know, for FSD, you know, mm -hmm. robo-taxis and that type of thing. You get into car, type in your account number, and all your stuff just syncs up, right? I would like to see FSD um, sync very much in the same way, in, the, in such a way that you get in a car, you sign up, your driver profile syncs up, and then boop, you get FSD there on that particular car for that for that drive, wherever the case may be. Um, if they have the hardware. Uh, yeah, well, all the cars have, hard, have right. hardware. Uh, every all car has, 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 has the do, software. Yeah. Well, every car also is running the same neural nets across the board. It's just you just can't use FSD if you haven't paid for it, but they're all running the same software. So it, it's just a matter of flipping a switch. So if they were to make it transferable in the sense that it's a floating license, it sits on your account and your license for X amount of cars, whatever the case may be, whatever you sign into, and it fo follows you around. Uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, for example, is something that I pay for. Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can pay for one license and you can install it on two computers. Um, the idea is that you don't use them uh, simultaneously. So the idea is right. you put it on your desktop and on your laptop. Yeah. The moment you try and install it on a third computer and you sign it with your account, it'll ask you right away. You get a kick one or the other off um and then so that way the you know the license uh, is um uh, is guaranteed to be um you're within compliance um and then that way it floats around I, I that's the kind of system that i would like to see implemented i'm going to posit that they would consider doing that on the subscription thing because now you're paying for life right it's a monthly thing and you're paying and you're paying and you're paying and you're paying so i don't think at that point they care which car you're driving as long as they're getting checks every month from you 
you know, or they're ringing up the card, then they're fine with it. But the, the, it gets where it's a slippery slope is this transference thing because you you only have to pay whatever it is now the 10, 12k once. And now you're expecting to be able to drive FSD for life. And right. it would be an even greater stretch to imagine. It's like, oh, not only do I want to drive FSD for life and you're going to transfer it to all my future cars, any other Tesla I drive, I'm going to have the license to drive FSD on that car too. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think they've done the math when Elon answered yeah. this question. I don't think they suggested it, but they know, they know the number of owners that have more than one Tesla in their lifetime. Oh yeah. Whether, oh, yeah. whether they're owning two concurrently or they owned one before and then bought another one as an upgrade, they know those numbers. Oh, really? So it makes sense to them to go, we have X number of owners that have had at least two Teslas in their lifetime. Uh, a certain percentage has sprung for FSD on one of those cars, if not more. So they, they do the math and go, if we just open you know the floodgates and let them just keep yeah. it in perpetuity, then yeah, we're going to lose money long-term when ideally they're the only company doing this. And if you're trying to build the robo-taxi fleet and the new SNX designs give indications why are less stocks, less controls, the computer's doing a lot more of the work, um, that if you're eventually going to go where you have a driverless system, you can't just have it running on this much, you know, I'm, I'm demonstrating this for a YouTube audience, but you're demonstrating, you know, my fingers are very close together yeah. for those who are podcasts, <laughs> but like having a very small, a number of $10,000 payments. And then you have your subscribers, which I think would outnumber eventually the total FSD owners who paid the 10,000 um, or 7,000, whatever they paid. But you know, the, the numbers would eventually offset where subscribers, as we're seeing now with cable, right? Where the numbers of, you know, offshoots of HBO Max and Netflix and stuff Maybe are subscribe to far death. outpacing cable subscribers. But anyway, you're going to see that happen. Well, they're not going to make a lot of money off of that. I mean, they have a nest egg now, but it's not going to take long for that to just go gone. Mm. Well, we're really getting down to, you know, a bit of a rat hole on this. And, and Eric and I had this conversation a little bit earlier today. Mm -hmm. Like, right now, you want FSD. You were very you gotta... mean, by the way. I didn't like it. I, I, you were just inconsiderate. <laughs> <laughs> just getting used to it. Um, you want FSD right now. You got to pay ten grand. Okay. Whether you buy it up front or after the fact, there's no penalty anymore. You still got to pay ten grand. So you right. go to a subscription model. Now, how do you enforce it? I mean, you, you used to get ten thousand dollars. You know, you got to get your pound of flesh out of somebody somehow. Now you're on a subscription system. What's the buy-in amount? What's the buy-in time? Let's say you lease a car for three years. Uh, you bought F and and you pay a subscription. You know, for FSD, and maybe you haven't pointed up to ten thousand bucks. Let's I don't know, pull a, a number out of my butt. Let's say it's a couple mm -hmm. hundred bucks a month. Okay. Um, you know, how long do you amortize that for? You get in a crash. Uh, you don't buy another Tesla. Do you keep paying for FSD on a subscription model uh, when Tesla used to charge $10,000 up front? I mean, there's a lot of variables with this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious to see how they're going to do it. Or maybe Tesla is just going to do what they normally do and just say, well, tough luck. That's the price you used to pay. And now the price is this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of like with, with autopilot. I mean, I, if I now take my... 2018 model three and i were to part of the market um unless you've done your homework as a prospective tesla buyer you may not know what autopilot is you may not know the difference between what i have enhanced autopilot which has features of fsd uh, that are now separate from the standard autopilot that comes with the cars so there's i mean you mentioned before like you know someone who knows what fsd is but i know for a fact i've seen this on social media i've seen this on forums there's a lot of interested tesla buyers that don't even know what fsd is or don't even know like even autopilot too, like what what that really entails who may not be looking for something like that now we know that most auto manufacturers nowadays have some variation of their autopilot systems for traffic awareness and cruise controls and all those different things uh, for safety features so it's not that's not really unique to tesla anymore but fsd is because of we're encroaching level four level five autonomy um, but there are a lot of people who don't need these things. They don't need these major features. And so for them, trying to educate them what this is and why it's important. And like my car to me right now, even though it's depreciated in value because I've had it now for uh, almost three years, it it is more enhanced than an SR Plus you're buying today. Because an SR Plus you're buying today without FSD doesn't have what my car does, which is Auto Park and Summon and all those other features that you can only get with FSD today. So you could spring ten thousand dollars for that stuff or you buy my used car right so there's a lot of people now that even doing the math going but wait a second if i want those various features of fsd but i don't need the full autonomy part of it that i'm the used car market may be booming 
very soon if the prices continue to hold where there are. Yep. And to your point, Trevor, if the subscription payments are substantive enough or some people go, that's kind of pricey for a year, two years, three years, because maybe they're looking at, you know, whatever their current bills and monthly mortgages and there, et cetera. Maybe it's expensive to spend one, two, three hundred a month for a subscription service uh, for FSD. Um, where they can just go, I'll just buy a used car, get most of the features, and save money anyway. Well, we were having this conversation on the forum a couple of days ago. Where I piped in and I, I made a post suggesting what I think would be fair, um, how Tesla really organizes this, is what they should do is is basically three tiers, right? You got your basic autopilot, and that includes you know your, your, your auto steer, not lane change, but auto steer, traffic aware cruise control. It's included in all mm -hmm. cars. Don't touch it. Leave it. It's just the way it is right now with all the cars. Then what they should do is sell a second tier, say, I don't know, charge four or five thousand bucks for it. Okay. Autopilot and then plus. right. And then call About it eight. enhanced autopilot. I mean, this was a whole discussion under the auspices is did Tesla screw up calling it autopilot, right? And calling it FSD. And I said, no, I don't think so. In the sense, autopilot is a very valuable term. The fact that Tesla jumped on that before everybody else was brilliant. I mean, everybody else is kicking themselves and not thinking about it sooner, right? Everybody has a variant of something pilot, right? And they're like, oh, we should have called it autopilot. And you can bet that that's what they're thinking. Anyways, Getting back to what I was saying, I think what they should do is sell it in three tiers. So you have your basic autopilot, go back to the nomenclature of enhanced autopilot, sell it for four or five thousand bucks, and that gives you your your summon and your uh, what's the, what's the other thing? The, the auto lane change and maybe and maybe and maybe NOA on 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 highways. Okay, mm -hmm. and then and then and only then do you do a subscription strictly for the FSD portion once it's ready and then that way you make it you make it a little more fair they still get the four or five thousand bucks out of you but then the rest of it can be amortized over a certain amount of time at mm -hmm. a couple three hundred bucks whatever the case may be and then what that does is that it really gives people the features that maybe they really want because a lot of people look at enhanced autopilot like i like all these features but i really don't need the car to drive me around 100 percent of the time that is just like a little sliver of time myself included even though I paid for FSD, mm -hmm. I'm not really going to use all that stuff. Uh, matter of fact, right. basic autopilot is mostly what I use it for. All the other stuff, like Summon, as far as I'm concerned, is a gimmick. Uh, until it really gets good, and I haven't seen any progress as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't use it. <laughs> so personally, I think that's... I think a three-tier system would work, right? You got a free tier, you got a paid tier for four or 5000 bucks, and then, and only then, when FSD is ready, then you you, 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 you do a subscription service just for the FSD portion. And I, I think that would be a lot fairer to a lot of people, and I think they'd get a better take rate. But that's my opinion. I like it. Yeah. Anyways, um, any closing thoughts, guys? We've been going now for uh, an hour and a half, so <laughs> uh, I had a feeling it was going to be hey, a long Elon show. Elon had a lot to say. We, we, we gave, yeah. By the way, we've officially had Elon on our show. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would have a lot more pointed questions than some of that stuff, but whatever the case may be. Yeah, Ian, you're going to say something. That is a show title. We're going to be accused of being the ultimate clickbaiters. So <laughs> it's tempting. Right. Um, no, he, he, no, he, 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 go ahead, Ian. Yes, the next got heat pump. I think that's so cool. Yeah, and that yeah. was a question. Hey, you, you tweeted that too. I, uh, I did. I was like, yes, good. And I mean, somebody followed on and said, "I wonder if Cybertruck will for sure." Well, of course, Cybertruck. Sure. Sure. Uh, no yeah. Back it, listen, the heat pump is here to stay. It's been implemented. It's going to happen in any future cars that are not in production yet. Yeah. Uh, that's a given. I mean, it's yep. so <laughs> bloody efficient. It's thirty percent more efficient than resistive heater. Of course, they're going to use it. And I think it explains because, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the new base Model S is quoted now at 412 miles of range versus I think it was 402 previously, right? Yep. So at probably that 10 miles was the heat pump. I got to guess. Yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. Also uh, interested too because it wasn't a lot of talk about Roadster. Um, no, it's when not the ready Roadster, yet. when the Roadster was first demoed and shown to people, it was November 2017. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I do wonder now, with all the advancements in battery tech and all the stuff they're doing, if by the time they really get close to production, if everything they projected the car would be, they just laugh at and go, "No, we've 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 done yeah. remarkably better. We've gotten no absolutely range and output, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera." Right? Two two things. One of them is obviously, if you look at the specs of the Plaid Plus right now, Roadster has to beat all of those. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. given. It has to. 
Um, and basically, the specs that are showing here is basically what the Roadster was going to be doing three years ago. Weren't they trying to get one and a half second zero to sixty? No, the yes. official the Roadster. The, uh, no, well, that's what the SpaceX package, I believe. Was, that's like bandied about well, number, right, right. that number was speculated upon but the official numbers was 1.8 seconds on the mm -hmm. base model or uh, no on the founder series i think it anyway, i don't have it in front of me but it was 1.8 1.9 seconds um quarter mile at 8.8 .8 seconds so basically we're there now today with the plaid yeah. plus model s so it's a given the roadster must beat these specs it is the halo car <laughs> <laughs> right? It is going to be. Uh, the other point of that, too, if you listen to Ryan's interview with uh, Franz von Holzhausen a number of episodes ago, uh, he had asked him about the Roadster, and he said the Roadster needs more time. So I'm sure they went back and says, well, what if we take the drivetrain from the Roadster and put it into the Model S, and then because I'm sure they came back and said, you know what, we now we're going to do these battery cells, we're going to do this, this, and this. Let's put all that in the roadster. Let's spend some more time and then make that car even better. So obviously that's what's happened. I mean, you don't have to read the tea leaves to see exactly what's actually going on. Uh, to leave all these specs on the, on, on the shelf just for the roadster doesn't make any sense. It's ready. It's prime time. Um, that's why they pull it into the Model S. It makes it makes total sense at this point. So I'm a, I'm encouraged uh, that the roadster is going to be even better than they announced um, by all by all measures. Um, how much design changes they do? Uh, who knows at this point? Um, I mean, one of my things is always looking at the car. How are they going to do the, the windshield wipers on the mm -hmm. model? On, even on the Cybertruck, where are you going to put the windshield wipers? It's completely flat. <laughs> so anyways, I'm very excited. Wipers. Very excited about, uh, <laughs> about what's coming down the pike, but uh, very happy to see that the Model S finally got some love. And uh, I just uh, sent a text message to a friend of mine who was basically on the fence as to whether he was going to trade in his Model S. So we'll see what he does now. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Sean Mitchell would trade his his Legacy S. Or uh, Sean probably might be attempted. I, I know he looked yeah, at a Model yeah. Y and he liked that. Um, Eli Burton, he's got a reservation for a Plaid mm -hmm. Model S. Now, whether he pulls the trigger now or he waits for the Plaid Plus, who knows? So, uh, anyways, well, I'll ping him on Twitter and see what his thoughts are. <laughs> I, you know what? I'm just what, what I really love the most about it is if you're a, if you're a track enthusiast, if you're a performance muscle car enthusiast, um, Plaid and Plaid Plus certainly gravitate towards that audience. But even just the the standard entry level S, I mean, it's an expensive car. Don't get me wrong, but just the fact that it has a Star Trek like interior. <sighs> already right mm -hmm. with the new steering wheel and everything else it has it has that roadster dna in a yeah. way yes um with with model three model y accents in there it's just it's it's the design you hoped it would be and they didn't screw it up they didn't screw it up and there may be people who aren't a fan of the steering column but again i i think as as more and more cars with rivian lucid tesla and other um legacy automakers coming in with their own evs you're going to see more and more and more of this where there's less obstruction. And also something I thought about too during the show, without the, without the large round steering wheel, which we already know the S and X currently have on the older models, is that if there's an accident, now you have less of your body, there's, <laughs> there's less wheels at your body to hit, right? Like a smaller steering wheel seems to be safer, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so it's good to see that, but the, the renderings are amazing. I, I, I'm i willing to bet this will be one of the first cars we're accustomed, because you guys always say when you go to the shows in California, um, which hopefully, knock on wood, it'll happen yeah. again sometime. But when you when you go, you're like, you don't realize how beautiful it is until you actually see it. This yes. may be the most true that we've ever said on the show, that it once you see these new SNX interiors, it's going to blow you away. Yeah, and how I, I would agree with you 100% on that. Um, I, there's I, I, there's talk about ambient lighting actually being recessed in some of that chrome trim around the car, so oh, yeah. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what it actually looks like in person. Um, mm -hmm. One last comment, speaking about the Roadster, of course, with all these you know horizontal screens and stuff. My only beef about the Roadster is I'm not really sold on that skinny center console screen that that's that's still vertical i really like to see get the the model s treatment i think that would really really be nice i mean who knows i mean i've got the model here behind me so are they going to retool that too i don't know we'll see <laughs> all right no, boys we, we got to sign off this one's been a long one i want to say thank you to everybody for listening and and uh and indulging us on this particular episode but it's it's fun to talk about this stuff we'll have a lot more to say soon so um ian since you're on the screen uh where can people find you if they want to have a chat with you well on twitter uh, the handle is at ian pavelko 
Tesla owners, Tesla owners online, the forum of choice yes. for all of your technical questions. You can hit me up there. Uh, Mad Hungarian is the handle. And finally, if you're looking in something of the way of Teslaware, you can find my little shop online at Teespring, T E Spring, all one word, dot com. Just look up Mad Hungarian Evolveware once you're there. And Trav, I'm sure you'll be kind enough to throw a link at Always the end of the show. Always in the link. So you can click on that. Excellent. How about you, Eric? Well, if you're on the YouTube video, you can see my handle here is at the bottom. It's ECFIX, E-C-F-I-X on Twitter. You can also uh, go to the interwebs. You can search for my name. You might find other Eric Camachos. They're not the real ones. There's only one real one. <laughs> not President me. Camacho. Twitter.com forward slash ECFIX. And as a reminder, uh, this is episode 95 of our podcast. As of episode 100, I will be leaving the show. So there are five more episodes featuring this ugly mug uh, left to go. So if you're a podcast listener... Never seen us on YouTube. Uh, if you want to see what it looked like, just go to youtube.com and search for Tesla Owners Online. Subscribe to the podcast. We love our subscribers. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Um, and uh, yeah, so five shows to go after this. It's been it's been a wild ride. I'm not sure what we're calling this. Elon was here, kind of. I don't know what we're going to call this show. But we, we, <laughs> appreciate, we, we appreciate our subscribers, our commenters, our users. Um, this audience has been absolutely fantastic uh, the whole entire ride. So thank you so much. Fear not, folks. Eric will be back on a semi-regular basis as a, as a guest. So uh, yes. he's not gone forever. He just needs to yeah. needs to do some other things. But I, so will wearing, I will be wearing, I will be dressing up for our special 100th episode. Yes. So. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> All right. Well, that leaves me. If you want to follow me, uh, you can check me out on Twitter, Tesla Owners Online. Check out the forum at teslaownersonline.com. Absolutely the best and friendliest place to talk about everything about Tesla. And uh, yeah, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, you can find the podcast if you prefer the audio version and basically every place that you want to. You can just look us up in Spotify. We're right next to Joe Rogan. Anyways, thanks for listening and watching, guys, and we'll see you in the next one. See you later. Bonsoir tout le monde. America's back. Yay!